Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to today's webinar in Knowledge Miles, the 695th Lord Mayor's Lectures. Today we have a fantastic lecture in store around the important theme of how we can deal with pressing societal challenges using management insights from physics and economics. And we have Dr. Marcus Nordberg, who is head of the um, resource development in the development and innovation unit at CERN. And we can't get much uh, more prestigious than that. It's in the free online lecture series where we address connections in and around the square mile, the world's coffee house, and how these might help us tackle future global challenges. My name is Hugh Morris. I'm a senior research partner at Zien, and I'll be convening this lecture and moderating the Q&A after these uh, remarks by uh, Dr. Marcus Norberg. So <clears throat> before we begin to get started, a bit of housekeeping from me, because my job is, as always, to get out of the way as fast as possible. Uh, the agenda for today will be to hear the remarks from Dr. Nordberg, then to take question and answers from the audience and conclude the discussion at around 45 minutes time. But without further ado, let me hand over to uh, Marcus for his remarks. And thank you very much indeed, Marcus. Thank you, Hugh. So good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Marcus Nordberg from CERN, as I got this nice introduction uh, from Hugh. And I was asked by the organizers to share my personal reflections about the connection between science management and uh, societal benefits. So that will be uh, the, the title of my talk. And I'm also a, a proud member uh, of the uh, founders livery company in the heart of London. Um, Jacopo, may I ask you to kindly uh, show the next slide, please? Uh, just to give you a very brief uh, uh, summary of, hmm, I, not sure I can see the text, um, but uh, what it should say, I will make the slides available for you. What it should say is that we are the 33rd oldest livery company out of the first 111. And uh, our focus has been throughout the history uh, on metal in particular. We started with candle um, pieces, but also then moved on to brass and, and even up to uh, turbine engines, uh, um, single crystal objects. Uh, we are supporting uh, university students uh, in engineering, science and engineering, uh, in many universities in Britain. And uh, uh, we are probably best known for uh, our involvement in the Big Ben. So four of the bells uh, have been uh, uh, provided by uh, John Warner, who is a, and the family connection is still there. I'm really sorry, I, I can't even read myself the text, but uh, so this is coming from my, my memory. All right, let's move on uh, to the connection from founders to the foundations of our universe. So here is an aerial photograph of CERN. What we do at CERN is to try to understand the first fraction of a second of the, of the beginning of our universe uh, as the, um, uh, the Big Bang about uh, 14, 13 billion years ago uh, unfounded. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is the Large Hadron Collider. This is our flagship accelerator. And what we do with this accelerator is that we accelerate particle beams, proton beams, in opposite directions, very close to the speed of light, up to about 99.99999% of speed of light. And then we make those particles collide. And when these collides happen, they happen about a billion times a second, we actually get a representation or re-representation as we believe uh, how our universe began uh, uh, at the moment of the Big Bang or shortly after the Big Bang. Next slide, please. So when these collisions happen, you can see a kind of a uh, a blow up, if you like. So particles coming in this picture from the opposite directions. Uh, this is the in, within the accelerator, or what we call experiments. 
I'll show you more about that in a moment. And you can see all these particle tracks coming from the very center of the collision point. And our job is to identify all of them. We can't see actually all of them because we are unable, because of limitations in, uh, in IT technology, to record them all. If we would be able to record them all, that would actually represent uh, equivalent of being able to store about 250,000 uh, films per second, and that obviously, I mean, data equivalent of film, and that obviously is a bit too much. We, there's no technology to our knowledge to do that. So what we then do is that we filter that information and only get certain amounts of data. So this picture that you see here is not the full picture. It's a filtered picture, but it's enough for us to conclude what happened uh, when the universe, our universe, began with the Big Bang. Next, please. We use a very high speed computing to do this, and we are well known for what we call the grid computing. It's better known as cloud computing these days. And this is the uh, only way to be able to uh, analyze the data in a reasonable time and then, then do, the, uh, do the data analysis and, and the related uh, data acquisition. Um, a link to City, by the way, here is that when we have the capability of very high speed computing, it's obvious that these sort of techniques can be and are used, for instance, in high frequency uh, trading. Uh, and they also can be used as they are actually uh, to monitor the timestamps. Those of you in the business know that transactions are linked with a timestamp. And there are certain rules and limitations as to the frequency of that or the interval for packaging different types of uh, uh, purchase requests. And this is being monitored and we at CERN are helping uh, regulators, and I believe one of them is in England, uh, to ensure that the uh, transactions are probably time, time stamped. Next. So just to kind of re, um, to kind of visualize what we are doing. So what we're actually doing, if you would use an optical telescope, you could go back to about, about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, which is 13.7 billion years old, roughly. Uh, but what we do is at the at the far end left corner in this picture where you see a little bit of bright light. So we are over that green area there. So that's where, where we are focusing. Now, I wish to emphasize that what we do at CERN and elsewhere is complementary to astronomy and cosmology tools that are being used. And uh, to get a full picture, we, of course, need to combine all the information. But our focus at CERN is really the first fraction of a second after the Big Bang. And that is what we do at the low left end of this picture. So next, please. Yeah, there's a little bit of blah, blah. So yeah, keep, yeah, keep on going, Jacopo. So we get the four boxes there. So there are a lot of unanswered questions that we are trying to understand. And maybe the most fundamental question that I unfortunately didn't have time enough to go into is the, um, the uh, the question of uh, the uh, where is 90 more than 95 percent of the mass energy of our universe we can actually only see or detect less than five percent of the mass energy in our universe now those of you in physics or engineering will realize that this is a fundamental problem to put it into city language it's almost a saying that that this if the universe were a company we could only explain less than five percent of its assets and that obviously is a problem for any accountant or anybody who is running such a company. Um, and uh, this is the problem that we are facing or challenge. So this is, a, I think, my personal opinion is, is as fundamental big challenge that we are facing in physics as, as physicists faced uh, at the end of the 19th century when James Clerk Maxwell, the Scottish uh, physicist or mathematician came up with his equations for electromagnetism. That started a chain of, of revolutions in physics uh, that we are still benefiting from commercially and, and elsewhere. Next slide, please. So I was asked to say a few words about the future and about the future of big science. We are part of big science. I don't like that word, but this is how we are known. Uh, big because it's large and requires uh, very different types of skills from many different fields. Now, in our case, uh, we are planning to build a new accelerator. Uh, you can see LHC there as a little tiny part. That will be the new one would be about uh, three times larger. It's called the Future Circular Collider. 
And the reason some people say, oh, because you guys are driven by ego problems, or just like you think the bigger is better, yes and no. Uh, in our case, this uh, comes from the fundamental laws of physics. In order for us to go to the very beginning and uh, reproduce the conditions of our early universe, as shown in the picture just before, we need high energies uh, because we need to get on a macroscopic scale to a scalable or um, a re a representative amount of energy uh, that would um, uh, correspond to the energy density uh, of our universe when it started with the Big Bang. So that requires us to build uh, bigger uh, equipment. I would like to emphasize the point that it's uh, the key here, and not only for us, but any other field of, of big science, uh, astronomy, uh, astroparticle physics, uh, life sciences, is scalability. Uh, we need to bring in more skills and more diverse um, expertise because the challenges that we are facing are becoming orders of magnitude larger. They are very, very complex issues that we are facing, it, not only in high energy physics, but elsewhere. And that requires cross-disciplinarity and international global collaboration. Next slide, please. So to go into the collaboration in more, which is the focus of this uh, very short presentation, um, we, uh, next slide, please. I uh, would now like to kind of start moving into uh, the specific topic of the links to the management and the way these experiments, like this picture here, Watlas, uh, were done. So next slide, please. So I would like to remind, again, it seems that we have lost the, the colors of the, uh, the background colors because the text is in light. But what this picture is showing is that I would like to just remind that these devices that we are using are of industrial scale. Next slide, please. So the different types of uh, medical uh, innovations that we, we have resulting, and again, um, okay, the slide seems to be okay, that we have resulting from the research that we do. This is just a few examples. They are mainly focused on uh, medical applications. I won't have time to go into them, but just to kind of summarize that, the way that we analyze these particle collisions I just showed you a moment ago are very similar to the way that we do um, medical scanning and uh, medical treatment using uh, particle beams for cancer therapy, for example. And uh, this is this connection is very, very strong and has been very strong. Uh, we at CERN have been instrumental, for example, uh, in developing PET scanners, uh, positron emission tomography scanners. In fact, the first ever picture taken of a mouse um, poor mouse, uh, was actually done by us uh, in Geneva together with the Cantonal Hospital. So next slide, please. But I'd just like to add here that, of course, I mentioned also IT already earlier. Now, this connection between um, science, um, management, and economics, what is it? And what do theories say? Well, the theories say something, and they are to some extent applicable, but there are some, some I wouldn't say contradictions, but some some differences that uh, have not been studied that much and uh, but anyway if you want to kind of look at it so there are three elements the science that we do so obviously the question is how do we approach our uh, scientific challenges uh, that means to say in our case we have to and i'll say more about this in a moment we have to collaborate obviously that's obvious and then we our way of working is that we do exploratory work meaning that we are driven up by theories, so we try to verify these theories, so hypothesis driven. And then what we do is factorizing. And what I mean by this is that a problem we try to put in smaller pieces, uh, which are more digestible. And then obviously we try to attack them in, in parallel, all these different sub problems. And then we need to reintegrate them back so that we have the original full picture answer. That is the way we go about things. Now, in terms of st strategy management, the question that it always asks, or mostly asks, how, how do we actually do this? How do we execute it? Planning and making an approach to solve a problem is not the same as actually solving it. So strategic management does uh, uh, bring in some interesting aspects, like how actually is the collaboration formed? Uh, how do we actually factorize? 
and and more importantly how how does this all scale up and how do we integrate things to get the full picture now economics is not too concerned about the how, how question in that respect it's more interested in in the in the question of resourcing and it does ask questions like how how do we structure or model the financing that's obviously a very important point so i'll say more about that in a moment how do we actually share the collab contributions so on the one hand they are expenditures on the other side they are contributions how is our both done who is who is getting benefits of this and who is actually contributing where do these come from and how is the monitoring of the arbitration done from the stakeholder point of view and i'll explain that in a few words in a moment and then of course and which is really the focus of this presentation how to create utility beyond the research this is usually a question asked by the stakeholders in our case the governments and taxpayers in general next uh, slide please Uh, Jacopo, next slide, please. So to summarize what we do and how we do it is in three points. So we have a vision. We don't usually use this word within our community, but I use it uh, for external purposes. So vision means that we are doing something bigger than life. We are actually trying to understand something which is a bit abstract, maybe. Uh, for a layman, but it's extremely important for us to understand how our universe began. So it's a, a it's a challenge. It doesn't actually fit in an Excel sheet. It's much larger. Then commitment. This has to do with the collaboration. This means longer time periods. We actually commit uh, in our undertakings for decades. So, so to give you an example of the Large Hadron Collider, the planning started already in the 1980s. Uh, the construction started in the early 1990s, and the accelerator and the detectors were completed 2008. Now, we've been running this from 2009, uh, with some smaller inter interruptions when we have been upgrading our machines. Uh, uh, and this will be running, well, we hope, until the, to the 2040s. So you can see that these commitments are long term, and people in our community are basically um, committing their full career in in these uh, in these experiments the third one is tolerance this is obvious i don't mean mechanical tolerance only i would also mean human tolerance and it's something i mentioned earlier which is about diversity we love diversity it bring, brings challenges in particular in team management and interestingly management books don't really talk too much about that uh, because of uh, efficiency um, prefer preference but uh, Yes, it uh, does cause problems in the beginning, but once you get a diverse team going, we believe they are capable of doing order of magnitude jumps, what is exactly what we need. Next slide, please. So the foundations of the collaborations, I'm just going now quickly very through how these uh, collaborations in CERN, in particular the Large Hadron Collider, uh, uh, were set up, and I'm focusing on Atlas simply because I know it best but it's very similar to the others. So actually, surprisingly, although these are, let's say, half a billion Jews currency um, uh, experiments initially, uh, they are based on only on a seven page uh, memorandum of understanding, which basically says, yes, we are going to do this together. And yes, here are the kind of shopping list of components, uh, and then some rules how to the collaboration will work. And I'll show some examples of that in a moment. I wish to emphasize, this is not a legal document. It is rather an uh, informal uh, on a best effort basis type of a arrangement and um, uh, for example in atlas and cms the two, two biggest experiments in the large hadron collider there there are over 40 countries involved in each of them and 200 institutions and uh, at the moment uh, the uh, the total uh, commitment for each of them is over 700,000 millions of respects used on a certain way of accounting and th what is also very important is that it's a bit like a um, a picnic party in the sense that people commit to deliver what we call deliverables and uh, they commit to share responsibilities but when i use the commit it's really on a best effort basis if they can't do it then others will come and chip in 
but the commitment is extremely tr extremely strong and it is very surprising how well that has worked for us next slide please so some simple rules if you like i mean they are not strict rules but but the idea really is that we do our best to let people dream not not more than five percent of their time but dream and I, when i mean dream i talk about this vision stuff think big do good and again to that previous slide um tolerating diversity and what is very important is that physics decides not the hierarchy so we um are, we have a culture of justification if you uh, wish to make a statement about the functionality of a detector of a new physics theory you have to justify it you have to come with calculations simulations proof uh, and that will be then debated they use usually very fiercely uh, but that's the way it works so there is at the moment sorry at the same time there's also collaboration and competition uh, this is quite interesting because uh, it's not only about you know altruistic collaboration for the benefit of humankind in understanding where we come from, but it's also very fierce competition on different levels, within institutes, between institutes, um, between uh, individuals and so on and so forth. So this combination of collaboration and competition is extremely important. Okay, next slide, please. I think I mentioned that uh, the way we work. So um, when, so, all right, I think I've already kind of mentioned this. So the individual freedom of indi um, is really respected and is in the core of the way the collaborations work, meaning that any individual, even if the collaborations are very large in the big experiments, over 3,000 people are involved, this has to really be given the opportunity to individuals to speak out when needed. And we have ad hoc teams. That if there's a problem, we form them based on the expertise, not where they are in the hierarchy necessarily, uh, to to address these issues. And uh, the, very importantly, we need to keep everybody on board because everybody brings in resources. So even if the solution for a problem does not, um, let's say, please everybody, uh, the, the commitment for everybody still to chip in is there. Okay, let's move on. Hmm. Yeah, so this is just a, a, a reminder of, of the rewards, if you like, or the currency, how we work. So this is a picture of uh, some scientific uh, papers, and you can see a lot of names. And in fact, uh, that's uh, the idea. All of the people who have contributed to the experiment, success of experiment, are quoted as authors, even if they didn't actually do the physics analysis. So for myself, for example, so I, I do have a degree in physics. Uh, but I have never done the physics. I was paying bills, basically, and making sure that there was money in the kitty. So my name is there. It's, uh, I think, on page 14 or something on the Higgs paper there. Uh, so it's about, you know, 15, 16 pages of names and then uh, seven pages of physics. And that's the way we work. Uh, but it's, I can tell you, extremely rewarding. I'm very proud that my name is there among the other 3,000. Next page, paper, um, slide, please. So now the question uh, is that can we actually combine the fundamental physics driven challenges and uh, addressing sustainable development goals? So here's a picture of IDS Square, the place that I work with my colleagues. So next slide. So the answer to that question obviously is yes, that's at least what we believe. And the way we do this at IDS Square, this link between our science and society, is that we uh, mainly, we have other stuff there too, but I'm here focusing on, on our student activities. So what we mainly do is that we, we uh, run student programs with master level students, usually second or third year master level students, but we also have PhD students and bachelors. And these are very, according to our philosophy that I've explained a moment ago, very diverse groups uh, from, from engineering, uh, business management, uh, product design, but also other, other fields. And we put them in these mixed uh, versatile teams and we give them sustainable development goals related challenges. Now, these are well described elsewhere, so I'm not gonna go into them. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples, but you can go and see United Nations has declared 17, one seven of them, and they differ from well personal well-being to um, uh, access to energy, ed education, uh, clean air, and so on and so forth. And these we have had now over 2,000, I think 2,300 students at Idea Square since 2014. And um, this has been an extremely successful program. 
and uh, the students uh, together with their teaching teams look at these uh, sustainable development goals and we at idea square try to kind of inspire them uh, with our scientific methodology so that they can actually are not afraid to address these societal challenges next slide please so some examples so here you see uh, um, um, an electricity grid so these are students who um, uh, focused on migration. This was one of the uh, sustainable development goals. And they found out that in refugee camps, uh, the distribution of electricity is a big problem. First of all, getting electricity to these is an issue. But once you get that there, it's not evenly distributed. And simple basic needs like charging mobile phones uh, can be a major and usually is a major problem. So the students made a, a kind of a, a AI driven electricity grid that distributes the load um, in a way taking into account how many mobile phones, for example, are charging uh, so that as many people as possible could get, a, get their mobile phones charged at least to a minimum level. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is linked to uh, food waste. So about 40% of food is wasted before it enters on our tables. So the students made a, a nice little tool where the um, characteristics of, in this case, fruits or vegetables can be measured using physics, simple physics tools. And this is a kind of a plate that measures the uh, resistance uh, of that, internal resistance of that uh, fruit or vegetable, which actually changes based on the level of ripeness. So the students made a nice little uh, example of this a prototype where you actually connected it to a mobile phone, they put this in the fridge. And when the, when the avocado or the, or the apple was right at, at the right level, it would, the, the mobile phone would send a little text message saying, hey, open the fridge, I'm the third apple from the left, please eat me. Uh, this actually was a big hit in a big uh, design conference in Milan, I think, a few years ago. Next slide, please. One student team uh, based on a program we are coordinating uh, at CERN, uh, myself and my colleague Pablo Tello called ATTRACT. Uh, this is low technology re readiness level uh, funded program. We are funding projects and initiatives with very low technology readiness level. And here's one example. Uh, this is a wearable PET. I mentioned the PET scanner earlier to you, the positron emission tomography. So the students came up with the idea that one could wear this uh, in places where you don't have medical treatment available or medical facilities available. And it actually technically could work. It's a bit, uh, I mean, it doesn't show all the necessary cabling that uh, would be required, but the basic principle was, was interesting and possible. Next. So what we do at Idea Square are different types of hackathons and events like this here. Actually, we are, we are doing a FPGA floating point gate array uh, training session for for young engineers and physicists that uh, uh, so it's not only about working with the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, but also linked to more industrial driven things. And uh, our students are very happy about this because uh, when they learn how to program these FPGAs, they are in high demand in industry, for example, in automation industries. Next slide, please. OK, we can skip that. That's, uh, that's, this was an event that was done for visually uh, impaired people. Uh, just to be very clear, the Idea Square, although uh, it's the greatest place uh, at CERN, we think, um, of course, uh, after the physics that we do, uh, it is not uh, a very, very big building. It's only 700 square meters. But we do have there uh, different types of uh, facilities available for people to do prototyping. And this, I would like to emphasize this point that what we want to do is prototyping. So all the students, when they do, can come and solve SDG related challenges, they also have to build a prototype. And that's what we make available at Idea Square. So we have a set of different types of tools. And uh, uh, yeah, that's basically, I think there's still one more slide, which I would like to conclude. I'm sorry if I took a bit longer than needed. So just to remind that we are in the business of open science, we are strong believers in open innovation and the process of doing science um, and then generating uh, benefits is, uh, is something where we believe strongly in serendipity, meaning that we do something fundamental and then uh, out of that fundamental new things are generated. And these are not necessarily 
uh, things that can be thought well in advance, like the web, which was developed at CERN. Um, it came be as a side product of the way of doing science, and that's the way what we believe that we can address these sustainable development goals challenges also coming from CERN and Idea Square. And uh, it's a little sort of a kind of a philosophical statement I'd like to end by saying that um, as important it is to know where you're going, it is equally important to know with whom you are sharing that adventure. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions. <coughs> Marcus, thank you very much indeed for an extremely illuminating review of how CERN in its broadest context works and the values that that work embodies. Yeah, we definitely have questions here. Uh, let me start with a, a very a technical question, which came up early on from Trevor Hilda. Um, he asks, can you not use laser beams to shrink the FCC significantly? Uh, that's, thank you very much. That's a great question. Yes, in theory, we could use very strong laser beams, and that's a, uh, um, uh, let's put it like this. We, we think that the variety of different types of particle interactions are uh, more productive using particle beams, meaning protons or electrons, rather than, than light. You can hit light with light, uh, but the, um, the, the variety of different type of physics that we, you can get out of that is more limited. So uh, yes, we wish we could shrink the FCC into something more um, uh, feasible, but that would not be fully achieved simply by using laser beams. Clive Bullen asks, uh, who are your key stakeholders? And I guess an inevitable question in these- I'm sorry, I can hear the question. Uh, who are your key stakeholders? All right, our, st our key stakeholders are governments. Uh, I, I did mention that in one of the slides. So the governments of, um, from all around the world, mainly European countries that are funding the fundamental operations, uh, the baseline budget of CERN. So we have 23 member states from, from Europe. But in the experiments, we also have a bit like, from like an a la carte base, uh, countries, much, many more countries. So in total, we have over, as I mentioned, over 40 countries uh, in, uh, in, it, in the big experiments uh, alone. Uh, so governments are our main source of funding. We hardly have any other type of funding, very small. And a supplementary from Clive, do you have financing issues? I suppose an inevitable question in current climate. It is clear that for us to achieve our research goals, uh, we would need uh, <coughs> more powerful uh, scientific equipment, which means relates to more money. Um, so our budget, our CERN budget, is about 1 billion Swiss francs a year. Uh, that is not, uh, depending obviously whom you ask, but that's not a, a, a huge amount of money if you compare it. It's a, a budget of a mid size of a, a mid-sized university, roughly, just to give you an idea. So uh, at the moment, uh, we are, I mean, this is a question that really should go to the CERN management, not to me, but uh, my understanding or my impression is that um, that we we can we we, are, we can manage, but we can't do with the current budget all this all the things that we would really like to do. So the next investment will be definitely something that will require more resourcing. Thank you. And Dan Feeney asks a great question. In a time of populism and division, how will you advise today's politicians? who seem short-termist, myopic and intolerant, and adds a comment, not much vision, commitment or tolerance there. That, this is a great question and indeed it's very sad what is happening at the moment, because it's obvious, as, as I hope I was able to show, that, that these are long-term commitments. I mean, these are commitments of decades. Until now, to the, um, the, let's say, to the credit of our politicians, at least in Europe, uh, I, I think this has been understood, and um, and we are very grateful for 
all the efforts that uh, they have made for us to to continue. CERN is this year 77 years uh, old in the business. Uh, it uh, sounds a lot, but to the, any of us who are close to 70 know that that's actually nothing. Uh, so. Um, so we just keep, need to keep on on um, on hammering the message, and and obviously, as as I mentioned earlier, uh, we do we do our best. Idea Square is one example, but there are many others at CERN. We have a very dedicated group on knowledge transfer. Um, we do our best to make sure that any new insights coming from our science uh, will be made available for the taxpayer as quickly as possible. Web is a good example, by the way, of that. We gave that away. We never patented it. We we didn't hurt any of the IP. We just gave it away. So um, with these sort of arguments, we hope that, um, that polit and usually politicians understand that it is necessary to invest in the future. Thank you. Andres Diaz-Pinto comments, many thanks for this great presentation, really enjoying it. And, and then he asks a really good question. You said humans only know about 5% of the mass and energy of the universe. How do we know it's only 5%? And how much have we advanced since the start of CERN? Oh, that's a wonderful question. I did say, I did say that it take, would take me another, I don't know how many minutes to explain it, and I don't know how much time you have. Uh, available to answer that question but the way we know that we know less than five percent is that there are different ways of measuring this and these different measurement techniques are at odd with each other and in physics we trust the principle of conservation of energy and uh, if we follow that line of thinking the conclusion is that what we see, and I, when, I say, when I say see, that means that when we measure the amount of light that we see in the night sky, which should indicate how much mass energy there is, that is not the full truth. And that what we can measure looking at the night sky is less than 5% of the mass energy that we calculate if we look at the movement of stars around galaxies. So that's how we know. Now, how much have we made progress since beginning of CERN? A lot. We, we have, I would say, our biggest achievement is uh, since now 10 years, which is the discovery of the Higgs particle. I'm sure most of us uh, know what that is. It's, well, we don't know actually what it really is, but we know what we should be talking about. This is a, a particle that actually explains why we are here. Uh, if we didn't have a Higgs particle, we would all be starlight. Uh, somewhere in the night sky. So the fact that we are not is explained by this particle and it consolidates a model that we call the standard model. Now we know standard model isn't complete. Uh, it's missing a very important piece, which is gravity. Paradoxically, gravity is the force that we all best know. And Newton in the UK did a great, great job in time. There are others, but he in particular in trying to explain how, roughly how it works and it seems to work very well, but we still don't understand what it is. So this is a big, big, big issue. So apart gravity, I think we uh, at CERN and elsewhere, not only at CERN, but together with other labs, I think we have made a huge contribution. And also on the uh, on the si side of what sort of things have come from our science, I did give you a couple of examples. Thank you very much. Catherine Curl asks another great question. Almost all human organizations rely on authority and ego. How has CERN managed to set up an alternative structure? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part. Uh, or, can you repeat, please, Hugh? Sure. It says almost all human organizations rely on authority and ego. And then Catherine goes on to ask, how has CERN set up an alternative structure? Yeah, that's, by the way, all the questions are great. Uh, this is also a great question. So uh, that that is actually exactly what I was uh, mentioning in the economic, uh, let's say, strategy management theories. This is kind of difficult to explain because usually uh, we are used to, and certainly in business world, into command control structure. Uh, in uh, in our field, this is absolutely not the model. 
uh, in our model, it's the physics that decides. And it's the, I think I mentioned this, it's, a, it's the methodology of ju justification. How did we get into this? I, um, uh, CERN was set up uh, just after the war in 1950s, and I think that this was kind of evolutionary. It was, um, it started, it has evolved. And um, in the 70s, I think it got established. That was before my time at CERN, so I'm not really sure. But I think that it, it was, um, uh, let's put it like this, physicists never really have cared much for management theories. Uh, they don't read those books. They don't even know what an MBA is, uh, usually. So uh, they just uh, kind of trial and error. Uh, they learned that this is the way to do things. And, um, and uh, just to be very clear, it doesn't mean that this way of working will will uh, will last forever but it's an evolutionary process and uh, we will see for the fcc and others what type of structures there will be they will certainly be dictated to some degree by the current political atmosphere for sure uh, but to the way we do physics i think the way we do physics that has been established ever since uh, uh, francis bacon and um and that is that that uh, you justify your thinking and then collectively there is some sort of agreement at least for a while whether that is the best way or the best understanding available i probably just got time for one last question from stuart castledine what learnings from the way cern has managed a large multi-skilled project do you think can be transferred to other very large organizations which need highly qualified people supported by technical administrative staffs, say the British NHS? And how do you think they can make sure that things work out effectively hmm. and efficiently? Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh this is a, a loaded question. So if you're asking my opinion about NHS, I don't know it that well. All I can say is that uh, it, learnings, uh, I, I, first of all, it's an evolutionary process. So it's not like that, you know, there's a theory and then we just follow how to do it. it this really has a lot of iterations. It's a little bit of trial and error. I think the key question here is uh, what I think where we have been quite successful is this question of scaling up or integration. That means to say that if you have a wicked problem, whatever it is, and it needs to be well, I use the word factorized, meaning that you're putting into smaller chunks, which are then si um, big enough, or let's say small enough to solve in parallel, that you will then be able to bring it up all together again. Because otherwise, if you don't do that, then you just have a bunch of problems and they are not connected or linked to each other. So that I think we have learned. Uh, and... Um, Yes, you are right. Uh, we are an expert organization, so I would definitely like to make it very clear. I am not suggesting that the way we run CERN or the experiments uh, would be the best and most uh, effective way to run a shoe factory or some other, let's say, commercial entity like a bank. I, I, I am absolutely would not even go that way. This is really um, these type of organizations like CERN and the experiments. They are really there um, for complex and um, uh, complex problems where the uncertainties are very, very high. They are for that type of things, and that's what expert organizations are. Now, to what level of um, uh, uncertainty or complexity they are in NHS, I, I have no idea. I can imagine that they are uh, big, but... Um, but um, so I, yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe I, I can't really say much more more than this. Thank Happy you to very have a much, private Mark. chat, by the by the way, because in few minutes I can't go into into too many details. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Marcus. And what a great question and answer session. Thank you, audience, for some fantastic questions. Thank you. Uh, sadly, that is all we've got time for. Um, and uh, I hope everyone has uh, enjoyed the lecture. Look, there's uh, a brief uh, view ahead to some of the forthcoming lectures in the series. Uh, we've got uh, 7th of March on the Thames Barrier. 
which my father was involved in constructing, so certainly a matter of interest to me. Uh, on the 13th of March, we've got the 18th Ezra Memorial Lecture, uh, and also we've got the remarkable evidence of how constructive or solutions-driven journalism is gathering momentum around the world. So I commend those to you. First, in terms of thanks, I would like to thank you all, the audience, for your interest and engagement. Secondly, most importantly, thank you so much to you, Marcus, for fabulous remarks that generated a huge amount of interest, uh, and rightly so. Now, this lecture and all our lectures are recorded and posted on our YouTube channel in case you'd like to revisit anything or recommend viewing to your friends. And we hope to see you all soon again for another lecture in the Knowledge Miles series. Thank you so much to all and goodbye.